Good evening and welcome to Momentous Live, episode 112, broadcasting from a series of undisclosed locations. I'm Tristan Jutra. I'm Will Sofer. And down here, I'm Gray Williams. <laughs> and, and a very lab-like in this undisclosed location, which we learn, which we look forward to learning more about maybe a little bit later in the show and in subsequent shows. Good evening, mm -hmm. gentlemen. Great to see you. Uh, of course, our lovely and talented colleague, Teja Custodia, could not be with us yet again this week. She, mm, she teased us, misled us into thinking she'd be here, but then something else came up, and, and we will... We will bug her relentlessly about that next week, but it's okay because she did another YouTube video, which we'll talk about at, at the end, later toward the end of the show, and it ties into a lot of what we'll be talking about today for the bulk of the show. But first, before we get too carried away, if you want to find out more about us at Momentus, you can visit momentus.tv slash links, momentus.tv slash team for social links for all our Momentus team members. And of course, you can find the audio-only version of the show at momentus.tv slash podcast, as well as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Amazon Music. Hooray! All right. Let's, oh, of course, it never, it never fails. There's always one thing don't have the links ready to go. And here we go. First, a little bit of follow-up, and guess what? It's mostly about AI until such point as we get around to doing our AI-only show, which we'll see if Getting that happens. There. It's a good thing we didn't do like an NFT-only show. That wouldn't have lasted all that long. <laughs> so are NFTs like last week's news? They're still there, but the... the the hype cycle. We're in the trough of disillusionment now. <laughs> They're still not fungible, so I mean, let's still see what they do in the label. Yeah, and let's not even get let's not even talk about the fact that some platforms, such as OpenSea, finally relented and stopped enforcing the uh, post primary sale uh, royalties mechanism. So, kind of kneecapping a lot of the purpose of or one of the benefits of the smart contracts associated with nfts so that original artists could get a cut of subsequent resales imagine mm -hmm. if you were selling um tickets for a concert uh, reselling them on, on StubHub or something like that if the original artist that you were going to see the musician got a cut of that resale ticket that's the same kind of idea that would have been enforced with nfts until people were circumventing um, that whole mechanism. And then large platforms like OpenSea, some of the, the largest platforms that actually sell NFTs, they relented and finally stopped enforcing it too. It's like, anyway, we digress. <laughs> we digress. <laughs> we digress. It's so easy to digress. We're looking for yeah. NFTs too. That's <laughs> NFTs too launch. We'll, we'll be right back on it. Exactly. And maybe, hey, maybe that'll be on the Solana platform. There's stuff happening there. Again, maybe. All right, well, let's, uh, let's get on to a little bit of roundup of... Uh, AI news, which is, of course, been the hotness for the last year or so. And one is one of the ongoing challenges we've seen with these image generation platforms, such as Stable Diffusion and Midjourney, and even Bing Image Creator now, among others, is, and well, you know this, and I'm great, you know, you know this too, I'm sure, not only do they have problems with fingers and teeth, they're getting better, but text mm -hmm. on, on, on in, text and images it's yes. totally messed up. And that's a, that's a huge tell. So now Stability AI, which are the makers of Stable Diffusion, has released a new model in, for image generation called Deep Floyd AI, which helps in your text to image generation and gets the text right. So again, as with anything, your mileage may vary, but some of the, some of the early uh, examples, I played with it a little bit and it seemed to work reasonably well. I'm just going to pull up a quick image here that I tried. And I um, used an existing prompt that they had for a baseball cap. I changed the colors. I changed the text. And look, oh, Vancouver Canucks on a white baseball cap with a green and blue trim. And it actually got the words. And I asked for it to do it in a uh, varsity style font. Not bad. If you zoom in, you can see some distortion in the texture of the fabric. But again, just think of how far we've come and how far we've yet to go. So in my single tests, uh, a sample size of one, it got text looking not too shabby. Mm -hmm. So Will, how, what, how, is it, how much of a game changer is this going to be for your image generation uh, should Midjourney, which you tend to use more, uh, finally integrate this kind of capability? I think that's a big thing for me. Um, I mean, I don't know how much I would use it, but it certainly is something that creeps in 
once in a while, even when you're not intending it. So uh, I'm just gonna throw one out here. You might say, um, I would like a uh, retro futuristic VCR and television. And then suddenly it would just throw VCR over something or make up fake text. Um, like at the bottom of the TV or something, and it would just be gobbledygook. And that would be one of the things as someone who, you know, tweaks and changes um, lighting and, and uh, uh, levels and contrast. But that's also something I would go in and take out right away with like clone stamping tools and content aware fills and stuff like that. Um, so it would, at least from the end of not having to do that kind of stuff, um, it would be better if, I mean, not that maybe in the example I gave, I would even intend it to say VCR, but at least it might not totally be an eyesore or it might be a happy accident or something like that. But right now it's pretty much a no-go. I also, I don't know if you guys see this, but I see quite a few people trying to make logos or uh, mock-ups for websites. Um, classic stylish website for a plumbing business. You know, and it's like this... I'm like, hey, guy, I could tell you that that was not going to work. Um, or, you know, logo for a uh, bespoke uh, suit manufacturer. It's like, oh, that's going to be hot garbage. Um, so... Thinking for a brand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hot garbage soup. Mm. Hot garbage suits. Um, so yeah, it, it's like those type of things. It uh, to your point, Tristan, it just fails on because it wants to try to add text because at least it knows enough that those things tend to have text in it. So I would advise people if they're going to try to do a logo or the odd time I've done something like that, like um uh, symbols or something um, or icons. I say no words in the prompts. Yeah. <laughs> like, no letters, no words. I'll add that in after. Thanks, because you're just going to muck it up. So, and even back to your VCR example, if you wanted to have it so that it said 12 a.m. because yeah. VCRs have the flashing 12 a.m. Yeah. Make it so it actually says 12 a.m. and not yeah. something out of like, uh, you know, the, that from the album cover of Ghost in the Machine by the police, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's again, if that was something I wanted to do, I would go in and do it myself right now. And I would most likely mm. just try to do some like prompt gymnastics to try to get it to yeah. make a screen without any text on it. Um, and again, say things like no words blank screen mm -hmm. um it's, instead I, of it's much easier like you said to say the screen says 12 a.m well ultimately go, well you know our goal is to remove you entirely from the equation when it comes to your own uh, image generation there so yeah. but i totally get what so, you're saying so, sometimes it's faster just to do the photoshop uh, after afterwards yeah. rather than you know prompt engineering until the cows come home yes gray i was gonna say something's got to generate the thought so i mean yeah currently so well, it's, it's interesting that you raise that point because I was listening to something today where you know we've been talking over the last few weeks how prompt engineering is becoming such a crucial skill. Mm -hmm. And some people, of course, say, okay, well, you know, that's the next big thing you should be studying. You know, so, you know prompt engineering. And before, you know, a couple of years ago, is you know, learn how to program for the blockchain like, like, you know, and whatnot. And now it's like, oh, learn prompt engineering. But what's, the, what's actually coming out of some of the uh, AI development companies themselves is saying, Hey, maybe pump the brakes a little, folks, because the AIs themselves, the large language models themselves, are actually getting pretty good at engineering prompts for themselves. And that's a, tr a, a trick that you can use. It's like you just ask it, what would be a best kind of prompt to use for ChatGPT? You can ask ChatGPT how to prompt it. You can also ask it for tips on how to prompt MidJourney or some of the other AI generation platforms, too. So Prompt engineering is great to understand in general. You can always tweak it, but it's like, yo, dog, I heard you like prompt engineering. So we put some prompt engineering in your AI so you can AI while you prompt engineer. <laughs> Something my, like that. My, my <laughs> only question, though, does, does chat GPT, I know there's other um, text generation tools, but does chat GPT, is it aware of MidJourney? Because isn't MidJourney too new? Well... Well, I, I, as of September 2021, I think Midjourney may have been around in an early form because by the time we started talking about it last spring, I think it was already up to version three or four, and that was so that would have been spring 2022. Yeah. But then again, there is 
like my uh, I'm on ChatGPT plus and my I just got access to plugins yeah. and web browsing. So what you can do is add a link when it works. Sometimes it does it can't read the links properly, but when it does, you can give it some information and you could train it that way. It's like, okay, with this in mind, the information at this link destination, you know, uh, about maybe it's on best practices for, for prompting mid-journey, it'll learn. And uh, alternatively, you could always try uh, Bing Chat, which is connected to the web too. Mm. Greg, did you have something to add there? I, I did, yeah. So this is actually, it's trained on the, um, was it Lion uh, B image library? So mm. you know, billions of image and text pairs, which is kind of, an, it's, an, it's a good way to go about it. Um, and it's obviously learned from this massive data set. The thing that I found interesting in that press release was the um, the ability to, to remove watermarked content, to remove oh, we're NSF, about stability AI here, yeah, stability yeah. AI uh, to deploy, uh, deploy. Uh, to, yeah. to remove NSFW content and inappropriate content, which means that this particular iteration is phenomenal for censorship. Uh, it's great for violating someone's copyright by removing watermarks, watermarks from images. Great, congratulations. Mm. You're really not helping in your case here. And then also, if we did, if we're looking at something and saying we want to be able to nuke this out of a certain image set, this tool is is custom built for that. Uh, which uh, we're going to get to regulation a little bit later, but this is sort of one of those like it's listed as a feature, and it kind of it's a feature that makes me go, mm, yeah, but. So uh, the next Instagram uh, hashtag campaign, hashtag free the AI nipple coming to you in three, two, one. <laughs> and we got a great poster for it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's good to see William Silver. Yeah. All right, uh, our next little uh, AI update. Um, there are a number of uh, voice generation platforms out there powered by AI, and they've really taken things to the next level. We've been using a few of those for some demos for clients in our work at Limestone Learning, and some clients even opt to use some of these for their actual uh, delivered courses as a way to make the most of their budgets and whatnot because the voices have gotten so darn good. Well, Eleven Labs has, with their latest release, has gotten ridiculously good and they do multi-lingual uh, voice uh, and it's it's wild and there's an example here um, that unfortunately this isn't won't share through restream but restream but a few fellows have had a chance to listen to this it's basically someone has gone you know, you take when you're a public figure there's lots of your voice out there whether you're a celebrity a politician an athlete you know tv movie star regular streamer there's so much of your voice out there that you can help inform these models and you can build your own models with tools like this, but then get your voice or these other voices to speak in multiple languages. And this in the show notes, we'll have a link to this tweet, which was shared, which was 15, or how was 30 seconds of uh, Joe Rogan. So who was, you know, comedian and, you know, Fear Factor host and longtime uh, podcaster now of him speaking literally perfect North American Spanish. And it is, it is wild. So again, probably not, I mean, I say perfect, it's probably not 100% perfect to a native speaker, but it's getting so good now for a lot of purposes, it's it does perfectly, perfectly suitable. So again, just, just imagine what it's going to be like in a year from now. And in future, so I can't wait till the day that we have our own momentous live stream when we have all four of us back together in AI form with the voices and the faces. Look, I, but seriously, we could probably do that within a year or two. Mm, and then we creepy. could just, we don't even have to phone it in. Our AIs could do it. <laughs> uh, I'll other make little, uh, <laughs> exactly. um, Some other quick AI news from the last couple of weeks that we didn't get a chance to uh, get to in previous episodes. Samsung bans ChatGPT and other AI chatbots after a data leak blunder. Now, this ties into something that Will has mentioned um, in, in the past. So what has happened is some uh, developers at Samsung were using ChatGPT to help them with coding. And they inadvertently shared some proprietary source code with ChatGPT, which you know, may or may not come back to bite them in the butt. But people have to remember is that every time you're uploading something or pasting something into ChatGPT, it could serve to further inform its language model in the future. It just gets absorbed into the brain. So Samsung has you know, realized that some of its developers are doing this. And they're like, nope, you uh, 
you do not do this because we, we notice that some of you are, and this could uh, end up, uh, it, you know, could end up having a bad time for the uh, corporate operation because some of these, uh, you know, so much of what's existing uh, in the chat GPT language model has been informed from open source code that people have uploaded to places like GitHub. And you, there may be certain elements that you could start to see, especially if they were uh, very specific techniques uh, that certain t developers use, or if there are certain comments in the code, there are certain flags that could cause things to be uh, identifiable to a person or organization. Similarly, when we're using uh, tools like ChatGPT to uh, help with certain uh, aspects of business, we make sure to strip out any personally identifiable information, whether it's names of our team members, of our company, of our clients, company names and whatnot too, because you don't want that stuff going up into the large language model for you know GPT-5 when that eventually comes out there. Uh, Will, uh, anything, uh, you, do you want to just refresh us on some of the uh, uh, that coding angle? I know you've touched on that before. Yeah, I mean, I think there is a bit of a nuance here, which mm -hmm. is, you know, like I've used it in my personal life um, for, you know, my site or, or other projects that I've worked on to figure out some relatively simple code like HTML just because I'm lazy or I'm hitting a roadblock <laughs> or something like that or JavaScript or uh, something like that. But I think the big concern is when um, large corporations coders are putting in large amounts of code or proprietary code that's written or has algorithms or has custom elements um, in it uh, and are then asking chat GPT to write more code or figure out what's wrong with code because chat GPT can help you with that. Um, that's now part of chat GPT. So if someone said, uh, how does the Samsung operating system work? You know, it's like, oh, here's the code for the Samsung operating <laughs> system. <laughs> um, so just you the know, trade secrets part. No, not to worry. Yeah. So I think if you are going to ask ChatGPT, like, hey, I'm having trouble putting three boxes in this HTML code using this CSS. Can you help me do a third one that wraps underneath? In a um, in a mobile media uh, uh, format, and it will probably help you with that. And that's no problem because that's just HTML code, right? That's not proprietary. But when you start talking about these intellectual secrets, or maybe even worse, unreleased projects, uh, you're working on a project and you've thrown that code in there. Um, so yeah, you just. I think that's where people are being careful because that's one of the main things I see um, both myself and other people that I know who code for various things um, is that it, it can help you when you get stuck or when you can't figure something out um, or it can just be a second pair of eyes like, hey, why, why is this not working the way I think it should kind of thing. Yeah, it's when you, when people are uploading giant patches of, of code and and asking uh, one of these tools to help debug it, which they can be pretty helpful at, that's when you yeah. get into you know sketchy territory there. But you know, for our benefit, we're looking forward to maybe someone from Tesla inadvertently uh, uploading a bunch of full self driving code so we can uh, you know get our Lego Mindstorms projects to like drive on their own. Why not, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can do that in the lab, Greg. <laughs> Yeah. Um, all right. Just another quickie in terms of AI follow up. We did touch on this a few weeks ago, uh, probably maybe a couple of months ago now. And this came up with uh, someone I know recently when we, because more and more normal folks, not just techies, more, more normal folks are becoming aware of ChatGPT. And this is just a quick public service announcement reminder there are no official ChatGPT apps available on the app stores from Apple. Or Google as of yet. There are a number of related apps, some of whom are using uh, GPT 3.5 and GPT 4 as their language model, and they license from, uh, from OpenAI. But don't download anything that says that's a chat GPT app, because it could very well be a scam. Now, if you are exploring some of the other services that use models like, like GPT or um, 
and what we're seeing from Anthropic and you know, Google and or Facebook. There's, there's some program, we talked about Poe, which is an app you can download that uses multiple language models in there. Just make sure that you are using the links from the actual websites of those organizations. And don't just like search in your app store willy nilly because you, as much as you know, Apple and Google uh, claim to be vetting things, <coughs> sketchy stuff does leak through there. So just, just a quick little reminder, if you know, Chad, the Jad GPT is a, is a website and you can save it on your home screen on your uh, smart device, your smartphone or your, uh, your tablet, and you can use it kind of like an app, but there are no official Chad GPT apps. So proceed with caution. And, you know, if you have any questions, you can always drop them in the comments. All right, moving on to a bit more, uh, just a little bit more AI news, but this is more in terms of issues. And just today, there were some congressional hearings uh, in, in the United States. Uh, they had Sam Altman come up and testify before Congress. Before we get into the quick overview of that, there was uh, one, a few weeks ago, there was that open letter signed by a number of uh, tech leaders. Uh, including Elon Musk, that saying that, oh, we need to have a pause on the development of AI, particularly open AI uh, with uh, GPT-4. They're saying, we've got to put a pause on this. We don't want GPT-5 to come out uh, too soon because we're seeing you know, logarithmic, if not exponential, improvements in the number of parameters that these large language models can handle, the, uh, the number of uh, tokens, uh, which a token can be a character, a word, an idea uh, in, in a conversation, and how and the more that they can keep in their short, in, in the language model, short-term memory when having a conversation, the more powerful it can get, the more you're able to copy and paste into a conversation at once. So um, these things are getting more and more powerful. And this is all these, a lot of number of these tech leaders were like, whoa, whoa, let's put the brakes on things. And we discussed whether we thought this was like them just wanting, wanting open AI to have to slow down so they can catch up. Now, one of the uh, perspectives that was shared uh, just today actually, um, I and mean, particularly uh, you know, with the headline, why Elon Musk is right about needing to regulate AI now. And the gist of this particular article is that for all of the other you know, you know, potential dangers that, that we've talked about, and of course, people often go straight to like Terminator scenario. But one of the key things in this article, I think it makes a pretty good point, has, and this ties into what we'll be talking about next with the congressional hearings, is that the sooner the... And, you know, I'm not a big fan of regulation in, in general, but sometimes you need it like for safety and whatnot. But the sooner that the lawmakers can more fully understand the technology and its implications, and politicians are famously not great at that, especially when we're ruled by gerontocracy and many of whom are well beyond natural retirement or traditional retirement ages and whatnot. But one of the key things is saying is that the sooner we get regulations in, the sooner we can nip the politicization of AI in the, in the bud. We've seen in previous uh, tech uh, if, I guess, um, trends, such as crypto, for example, that there, it was very late for politicians and regulators to get involved. And what happened, and Gray, I think you might be able to comment on this, is that people kind of got into their camps and it almost, crypto almost became a left-right issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. And where there are some people who may be naturally sort of liberal minded were like, well, no, crypto has this potential for, you know, people in developing countries and whatnot and, you know, regimes with, you know, flaky uh, dollars and, and, and the like, you know, unstable currencies. And then, so you had these people who are naturally maybe supportive of this sort of thing, where found themselves against it because you have people on the other side of the aisle who were for the, the libertarian types and whatnot. So uh, that, that's kind of the point of this article. It's kind of interesting. It's like, Get, getting into this issue early before people get into their camps. Now, Gray, based on what you've seen with previous issues like crypto and perhaps others where the, the tribal sorting happened because the lawmakers took their sweet time to get involved, um, what, what, what are your thoughts on, on, on this perspective here? I, I think it's actually the right perspective. Um, mm -hmm. Looking at this, you know, we're, we're seeing AI obviously grow at a very fast rate. Um, it has the potential to not just, you know, create these two divided political camps, but to actually put all of us in a very, very difficult position as it takes advantage of human work and isn't paying for it. Um, the, the fact that it can do that, the fact that it will probably make great convincing arguments about how it's not doing that is actually the most dangerous thing. <laughs> like we, we now have something that is smarter than Donald Trump who could do worse things than he was trying to do when he first came into office. Uh, this is, yeah, 
we, we need to be able to look at this and go, this is not written by a human. This is written by a you know, collective mind that is bent on following this one goal. Um, you know, the Fairness Doctrine was, was repealed in the, in the US, I think it was like late 80s, early 90s. Um, and so we've seen humans when they're capable of pursuing a political goal free of the burden of truth can do very dangerous things. There's a scene in Star Trek Picard where, you know, they're basically looking and, and Data's like, they, they need I mean, this mass amount of calculations done in a very short time. <laughs> and Data's the guy. This is kind of what we're up against. There's this insurmountable goal of swaying humanity in a given direction. And this thing that's responsible to no one that could do it. Yeah, we, we, need to, we need to get that in. We need to get it in fast. Because one of the other political motivations that there may exist for not regulating AI is to be able to use its tremendous capability to further toxify the information landscape, especially as we were you know, a year and a half away from the next US presidential election. So there may be certain interests that are like, oh, no, 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 let's, let's just keep it wide open so we can continue to use these tools to generate deep fakes or generate false stories or create plausible deniability. We've talked about that, like the flip side of things. Oh no, that wasn't me. That was actually a deep fake. And things are going to get harder and harder to tell uh, what's real and, and what's not. So there, you know, there could be political motivations for lack of regulation. So it's, it's interesting to see this all kind of happen in real time much earlier than we've seen with things like crypto or even like the, the internet or the, the World Wide web itself, where it took a, a while for certain, uh, certain lawmakers to wake up to some of the implications there and, you know, busy catch up regulating. And again, we'd want to always have a light touch, I think, wherever possible with these things so as not mm -hmm. to stifle innovation. So it's, it's finding that, that middle path um, to you know, regulate around the edges where there are legitimate dangers, but also creating enough uh, white space there for people to really see what the, you know, the, 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 the power of these models can do, these machine learning and AI models can do uh, without, you know, destroying the world. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing too is that, you know, we're on the cusp of, or we're in the heart of a new technology and we don't know its full path or, you know, what it's going to end up doing. And, and, you know, people used to have these conversations about things like television sets or when the computer first came in, you know, we're not going to have to work anymore. We can have uh, three day weeks or, or whatever, you know, or the internet was going to destroy everything. So I think there's often a lot of hype and fear about things that we don't know when, where it's going to go. And um, I mean, obviously you need a, a hand, you need to be cautious of it, but I think there is also a camp that tends to freak out about these things. Um, so I think that's also a good, good point is it's, it's something that some people jump on and just go, oh, the sky is falling. This is the end of humanity. Yeah, so the earlier this can be a bipartisan cons uh, issue, yeah. that, you know, that's great because, you know, there's so much division, so much tribalism. So let's let's get together from various political perspectives and try to navigate these issues in a mindful manner. So speaking of which, there, as mentioned, there was a U.S. Uh, Senate hearing today where the, uh, Sam Altman, the uh, CEO of OpenAI, got the, got the congressional hearing grilling. And we're not going to dive too deep into this, but I just wanted to um, review this. There's been a few articles that had some of the top takeaways, and I'll just touch on a, a few of these things, and we'll leave the links um, in the show notes for further reading. One of the interesting highlights was uh, Senate Chairman uh, Richard uh, Blumenthal uh, actually used his own AI-generated voice recording and chat GPT for the opening remarks. So the kind of stunt that people like us have been pulling on podcasts and uh, you know YouTube videos and whatnot, where it's like, oh, by the way, what I just read to you was generated by ChatGPT. And they did this in this congressional hearing by, you know, and maybe he had an assistant help out, but the, the extra layer was that it was actually in his own voice. So we talked about Eleven Labs and others just a few minutes ago that can do these, this voice cloning too. So that was kind of cool. And it really helped to demonstrate rather than just talking about issues, actually being able to demonstrate. Um, and Gray and, and Will, you all, you both know this from when we've taught classes, right? 
It's one thing to stand at the front of a room and say, oh, you're talking theory about search engine optimization or digital marketing or writing for the web or web design or whatever. It's like, oh, actually, uh, maybe we should look at some examples and we can do some show and tell. Yeah. So it's exactly the sort of um, lesson that they're taking to the credential hearing, which actually demonstrated a bit more uh, knowledge and uh, conversance with uh, this particular issue. Um, so some other issues that, that got touched on were, were the uh, fears about job replacement, um, re the, the notion of regulation as discussed, it seems to be a, a bipartisan issue at the moment, the need to regulate. Misinformation is still a, a, a huge concern. <laughs> One senator, Marsha Blackburn, um, made, made, made the example of she heard some song uh, that was uh, basically a deep fake of Garth Brooks and was a little concerned. I mean, people kind of make fun of this example. And we've, we've talked about it in the, in the past, a few weeks ago with all these uh, Kanye. Uh, Kanye sings Adele, Kanye sings Gautier, Kanye sings all these songs. Well, this Marsha Blackburn uh, was concerned about uh, Garth Brooks being deep faked and, and, and singing other songs um, as well. So I mean, that does raise the, the issue that we've touched on about um, how much does one owns one voice, for example. So there's some, there's so much stuff. Uh, and then of course, it, this one day hearing, they all agreed that uh, national security, well, that's such a big issue. We're just gonna table, we're gonna table that for uh, that issue and cover that another day because they could spend probably a whole week on national security implications of artificial intelligence because we know that other regimes around the world are pouring lots and lots of research dollars into AI for things like surveillance and defense and when you talk about how you can, we've, uh, I think we've spoken in the past about uh, AI uh, powered drones that would have image recognition technology for targeted assassinations and stuff. That's, we have or whole organizations like stopkillerrobots.org concerned with these very dangers for, for years now. So that is uh, you know, six key themes that came out. And then we'll uh, include in the show, uh, show notes another article um, that has uh, nine takeaways there that include a few other uh, points um, as well. Gray, any any observations uh, about what we're seeing from uh, the U.S. government on this? Again, these early days talking about these concerns and possible regulatory um, solutions. They get this far more than they get crypto. <laughs> it's like they there there is understanding there, which is heartening. Um, you know, I, I, maybe it's maybe it's subject to easier to understand. Maybe it's the threat to themselves that uh, I think they can they can wrap their heads around. But I'm I'm not having the same desk slamming head, head slamming into desk moments. Yeah. that I had watching them try to uh, and fail to really understand crypto in general. So I'm, it's Garth I, Brooks. That's that's what helped yeah, them understand. Yeah, yes, they can get yes. that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, that, that and BTS and we're, we're headed from all angles of the aisle here. So yeah, I'm, I'm heartened to a degree. I, I wonder if how much of that is due to the fact that the onboarding for something like Chad GPT and some of the and things like Bing Image Creator is so much easier mm. than onboarding into your typical crypto platform. Like, oh, how do I, my my nephew told me about Bitcoin? How do I do this? Blah blah blah. And so it's it was a lot trickier to get people using the tech mm. uh, as opposed to this case where like so many people have used tools like Chad GPT and others. We had a hundred million users within the first two months. Like, the fastest growth of any tech platform ever. So it's quite possible that a lot of these lawmakers have actually had a chance to, to fiddle with these things on their computer or can, their, their smartphone. Can I chuck out another theory? And I know you got, I'm just playing devil's advocate, but I do believe this. And I know you might disagree with me, but I think the three of us can look at NFTs or cryptocurrency and see benefit or see what it's there for. I think it's a harder thing to convince most people of. I think especially NFTs was something that was like, what do you mean I don't own the thing? It's just the chain of the thing that I own? Well, I don't care about that. That's dumb. And I'm so, burning fossil fuels to buy it? What? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think like that, that just explaining it, like it, there was just too much of a barrier for people. And I think... It, it was never really like, and I mean, I could be wrong. Maybe it's going to take over the world and, and everything, but I think it was just too hard for people to really get down to it. I think the other thing that, especially NFTs, um, and it was exciting, sort of the different experiments that people were doing, like concert tickets and um, records that you, that you get as part of the NFT, but it's sort of like the flat earth theory. Like it, there was not one thing. There wasn't one 
thing that you could understand. There wasn't one underlying principle to it, right? So it's just like well, it's decentralization and the uh, the blockchain and uh, you know sovereign digital uh, personal sovereignty and it's, it's a lot of that's a well, non seller for most people. So exactly. if they, if you boil it down, most people would be like, don't care, too complicated, not going to figure it out. Mm -hmm. So I think, but uh, when you start giving examples of like especially senators where you can impersonate their voices or impersonate their faces. Like, now that's scary. So mm -hmm. they can get behind that. So, uh, yeah. So I think, um, I, I think that's the uptick that you're seeing is that it's an easier explanation, sort of just reiterating what you guys said, but, but with other examples. Yeah. The, the, the opportunity to, to play with these tools is, and, and have that real world experience and the, these AI tools being, uh, so much more accessible. I think definitely are a, a big part of that as well. So um, moving on to uh, one other <laughs> little AI bit of, of follow-up before we get into talking about Google I.O. is it's, it's a bit of a hack, but it's kind of fun, is that uh, there's an article on ha Hackaday a couple of months ago, MS-DOS client brings chat GPT to the IBM PC. And it's not like this is breaking news or anything, but I just, we haven't had a chance to in include it in previous episodes. So this is basically, uh, someone figured out how to uh, hook up uh, an old luggable, uh, IBM PC compatible uh, luggable. Actually, no, it's actually not compatible. It's an IBM 5155 per portable PC, which is a uh, PC XT with a you know, 4.77 megahertz, 8088 CPU, 640 kilobytes of RAM and a CGA video card. Uh, so I had one of those beautiful uh, amber monitors. Mm. So not entirely different to the um, Osborne's and K-Pro uh, luggables that we've seen in the past. But the, um, the the cool thing is is that this person got it wired up and through with, through some connectivity to uh, another internet capable device and had it so you're having your little text chat because you know back in the day people were used to the DOS operating system which was all before the graphical user interface became uh, more, more widespread. Mm. But you know, it's, it's almost like War Games vibes. You know? Would you like to play a game? And you're having a little conversation typing in, just like you know, back in the late 60s with Eliza, the, uh, the uh, text-based psychiatrist that we've talked about a couple of times here. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Will, I know you like retro tech. Oh, yeah. Any, would you like to if maybe dig out your dad's old Osborne and uh, get ChatGPT running? Well, that? that would be cool. Um, I, I mean, I think it's an interesting experiment. Um, I don't, I think I've kind of, I don't know people are doing it more or are just seeing it more and now the algorithm knows, but I send you some things like off of Instagram, uh, things like this about people setting up computers to run windows and stuff like that. The other one, sorry, I know this is kind of a, a side story, but um, the uh, other one that has really been fascinating me and I think I sent you one of them is the guy using old CRTs to either run um, a, like a second monitor um, for his Mac, which it and the the gymnastics that he has to go to to get it to those the remember those old like ra rabbit ear two prongs and like he has to like go through so many adapters fifteen <laughs> adapters or ten <laughs> adapters or whatever. But the other guy that's really cool is the guy who's doing sort of art with old CRTs and video. And then he's having like basically, um, what's it called? The, the oh man, um, there's a name for it. it. It's a trick where you have like a piece of film suspended and and the light hits it. So it looks three dimensional. Mm -hmm. um, uh, something ghost, what's it called? Uh, Pepper's ghost. Oh, cool. So he's doing like Pepper's ghost things with old CRTs. So I'm definitely in for this is what I'm saying. I, I, I like the idea of mucking with old tech and, and adding some new ideas and making it sort of this Blade Runner future thing. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, retro futuristic. Actually, this ties into something that we'll be talking about uh, in a little bit as regards uh, TV and film. But let's segue into some um, new AI news as part of Google I.O., which is Google's big developers conference that happened last week. 
it, on Wednesday, so it was just after our live stream. So we just have to catch up on a little bit of news there for it, for those who are interested. And one of the major announcements was Palm 2, which Palm is the large language model that is behind uh, Google Bard and a lot of other uh, AI initiatives at Google. And basically, they uh, you know announced the next generation. And of course, it's much more powerful. Um, but one of the key things is that it is integrated into uh, not only Google Bard Chatbot, but Gmail, Google Docs, Google Sheets, and uh, YouTube. So um, this will be living in their data centers and power their public and private facing uh, AI efforts uh, for the next time to come until, of course, they upgrade to Palm 3 and the like. So they are not sitting still. There were some, when they uh, released Bard, Google Bard publicly, uh, not too long ago, some people thought it felt a little half-baked, uh, it, it may be rushed out, but the, obviously Google has, has had lots of stuff going on internally. And the latest updates uh, to BARD have uh, been better and more powerful. So um, our very own Teja Custody has done a number of videos on that, talking about BARD and how it compares to ChatGPT and Bing Chat and the like as well. One of the key things was Palm 2's reasoning abilities, because with these language models, they don't actually think or know things per se. They are good at languages, bad at math, Sound familiar? <laughs> um, I, and again, uh, yeah, uh, bringing it up from things that we mentioned earlier, they actually point out uh, in in that uh, Google I/O about improved coding. So they talk about getting better at coding and and being more proficient at coding languages because that is one of the big use cases. Is uh, like you say, doing doing some bug testing and and um, descend the checks on stuff. Exactly. So, so there, there were lots of stuff talked about at Google I.O. So we're just going to touch on a few of the highlights, including some of the cool looking hardware things. So in addition to all the AI stuff, they did talk about the latest version of Android. And I think when we get, when we reunite with Tasia, she can fill us in on some of those details there. Um, and the key things that we're going to touch on today are the hardware announcements. The first of which was the a product that they teased last year, which was the Google Pixel a tablet. And at the time, again, it, it felt a little underwhelming to a lot of tech observers. But now that it's been announced, there's a couple of interesting innovations and one really interesting price innovation on, on it as well. So basically, this is a, a, another kick at the Android tablet can. Um, there, it, It's funny, I remember it described a few years ago that there was the there wasn't a tablet market, that there was an iPad market, and then there was like a handful mm -hmm. of Android tablets. Part of the problem being is yeah. that Android was never very well optimized for tablet use, and a lot of the apps mm -hmm. were just kind of blown up smartphone apps. Um, so, it, you know, again, Google has had uh, previous tablets that they've uh, come to market with. Samsung sells a you know, fair number. They're probably the dominant uh, player in the Android tablet market. But... Google is taking, like I said, another kick at the can to try and show other developers how this is this is how you do a tablet. But again, they're not to, you know, necessarily dominate the market, but just lead by example. And one of the angles that they've taken with this is to make it into kind of like a Google Nest Hub, which was previously a dedicated device. Uh, that would have, you know, maybe a built-in speaker and use, be used for the smart home features of, uh, you know. Uh, in your household, but now they've got a, a, a multi-purpose tablet, sort of like an, an iPad. But one of the key things is that it has a, it actually ships with a dock, uh, that magnetic dock that you can stick it onto, and it turns it into kind of like a Google Nest Hub. Now, some people are criticizing because there's no real speakers and you know, high-quality speakers built into this, so it feels like a missed opportunity. But the fact that they've got this whole thing for I think it's like four ninety-nine US. And that includes the the dock for it that you know for, for standing on it seems to be a pretty aggressive uh, you know play here. And there's a, a case that has a, an interesting uh, metal ring on it that you can you can keep the case on and still dock the device. And and spec wise, it's it's fine. It's not going to set the the world on fire. But those for those people in the Google Android uh, ecosystem, it seems to um, be a pretty capable device and. The icing on the cake is that smart home, 
you know, home hub sort of uh, fun functionality there. Uh, Will, I don't, from what I recall, you're not super deep into the smart home, but w would you wish, uh, you know, you, given that you have, you've had iPads for a while, uh, are you interested in that, that sort of idea? Do you wish Apple or, or others would have something that would be very easy to dock to, especially if it was aggressively priced in this, so you could, you know, have it sitting there when you're not using it, you know, playing, you know, slideshows or, yeah, acting as a control center for smart home devices, uh, et cetera? No, not that much. I mean, occasionally, but I, to be honest, that's not the use case for me for tablets. And that's not really how I do things around the house. So I'm, I'm not too interested in this. I like cool docs that make it easier for me to use my tablet for the things I already use it for. But in terms of using it as as like brains for my connected home, I'm not interested in. Okay. How, about, how about you, Gray? You've been in the smart home world for a while and we're with this Google's um, revisiting the tablet world with the latest iteration of the, uh, the, the Pixel tablet here, which has that cool looking little stand that you can magnetically attach your uh, Pixel tablet and use it for your you know, family photos or for your, to, to be a control center for your smart home. Um, we, you know, I assume you're not gonna be switching to the Android ecosystem uh, anytime soon, but does that uh, use case uh, appeal to you from, a, from, a, from when you're not using, actively using your, your iPad? I, I mean, it appeals to me on two fronts. One, for older iPads, this is actually something that I would love to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a I've got a 13 inch um, 2018 Pro wow. that I use every Good once boy. in a while, mm -hmm. and uh, and so so that would be something that would be um, sort of I could see a use case for that. Uh, you know, the integrated like in wall solutions we're seeing fewer of just because again, I think folks have kind of looked at it and went, okay, the the iPad right in the wall um, is you're kind of limiting yourself, especially when form factors do change. Um, also. The second sort of place where I could see a use for this um, is the mom and dad factor. Um, when you're looking at, at, at I want to get them another iPad because my dad's got my, my Generation 2 Mini that he likes reading things on. Uh, but that's obviously, it's so far out of date now that that's pretty much all he can do is, is that. But them having an iPad that they ha had a home where it could drop it down, it could control things like their Ecobee, their Apple HomePod minis, um, and also FaceTime calls. I think would be sort of the ideal uh, place where I would use something like this. And so, I mean, it's a nice little stand. It's great. Um, you know, currently right now you could do something like get the, the magic keyboard, um, which could kind of fill that role along with giving the thing a darn keyboard to use. But uh, this just seems like a cleaner, a cleaner setup. I like it. All right, moving on to the next hardware, uh, one of the uh, other hardware highlights covered in Google I.O. 2023 was the Pixel 7a. So the last couple of years, Google has had this interesting uh, strategy where they've had, they've announced like the regular flagship in the fall. And so we, we had the, the 5 and the 5 Pro, I believe, the 6 and the 6 Pro. Uh, but then, you know, about six months later in the springtime, we would see the 5A and then the 6A. Well, they've done it again with release, releasing the 7A. And, and again, with, with the last couple of years, it seems like Google's been intentionally leaking details. Some people say they're just like a really leaky ship, but it just, it feels in intentional because there's so many details that come out early about these uh, devices. And in this case, uh, and, and the 6A, the 5A and the 6A have pretty decent reviews and for the price and really, really um, you know, good value compared to what you might pay for a flagship um, smartphone nowadays. So this is no exception and probably the best example where the specs are almost the same as the Pixel 7 that came out last fall. Not the 7 Pro, of course, but the Pixel 7, which is pretty decent. It's got wireless charging, 90, uh, 90 hertz refresh rate. And this phone, which is you know, some, you know, some flagship specs, not all, but it's only $500 US. Now, well, I know that you're, you, went, you went ultra premium in your last, you got the... 13 Pro Max. Now, do you feel like next time when it comes for you to update, upgrade your smartphone that um, you would go for such a beast? Or do you feel like there, there's untapped potential there that maybe you're being overserved and that you would consider something, A, less powerful because you don't need so much power because maybe you're using uh, other devices like your laptop for more intensive operations and you're not do shooting lots of 8K video or stuff like that. And or 
you know, smaller size. Again, with this Pixel 7a, this is more of a 6.1 inch as opposed to like a 6.7 inch. And 6.1 seems to be the default now for uh, mainstream uh, smartphones nowadays. Any thoughts on either of those aspects regarding power and size? Uh, I would say give me all the power, all the size, and uh, make it cheaper. All right. So yeah. So we'll definitely. Apple is definitely going to release the uh, iPhone 15 Pro Max at five hundred dollars US. Yeah. Yeah. Heard it here first. <laughs> yeah. Snowballs meet hell. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah. Do it. Make it happen. Well, the uh, the and the other smartphone news, especially uh, from from Google, and this is something I wish that friend of the show Jamie Reynolds was available to chat with us this week. But maybe next time we're on, he's on. He can uh, give us his thoughts. Is the long-awaited, long-rumored Pixel Fold made its uh, appearance at Google I/O 2023? So, following in the footsteps of Samsung, which is on the fir- their fourth generation of the uh, Samsung Galaxy Fold. And now we have, we've seen other options from, uh, what was that, Royal FlexPi, I believe, was one of the uh, other uh, offerings out there. We've seen, I think Motorola had some f- foldables. So this, the Pixel Fold is not the f- flip phone, it's like, it's the, the fold phone. So it's, uh, it basically goes from a smartphone, normal, a normal-ish smartphone size, and it folds out into like a small tablet. I believe it's 7.8 inches. Now, what the people are saying so far is that it's not as, as skinny as the Samsung uh, Fold, Galaxy Fold 4, so it's a bit more usable. The outside screen is a bit more usable for straight-up smartphone use, and that being said, but it's still, it's thinner as well. The hinge seems d- decent. It's got water resistance, um, but not dust resistance. And so we always have to be careful with the, the hinges. How long will these hinges last? And of course, they've t- tested them for hundreds of thousands of opens and closes. But depending on how fidgety you are, you might be able to burn through those opens and closes in a few months. Uh, now, the, the only catch with this very capable looking device, and apparently the cameras are great, much better than some of the cameras we've seen on other foldable uh, devices. And the ability to, because it's got a full screen on the outside, as opposed to like a partial screen on, on the uh, on the outer side of the, um, the device, you can use that outer screen as a viewfinder and the f- proper back camera for selfies, as opposed to the front facing camera, which is usually a little less capable that we, we use on most of our smartphones for selfies. But uh, the catch here is that we're looking at seventeen hundred and ninety nine dollars US to get into the door. So, Gray, I'm going to ask you: Is Google high on their own supply here? Can, especially given that at the other end of the spectrum, they've got something for five hundred dollars US, which is very capable. Of course, this has you know three times more screen. Mm-hmm. It's got you know it's got infinity times more hinge. <laughs> It's got, I believe, one, you know, one extra camera in there, perhaps. Um, this is like we're in the ultra premium territory here. Yes. Is, yeah. is this is this nuts? And, it, and and if not, is this something Apple should be? And everyone's like, when's Apple going to do this, et cetera, et cetera. So, what what are your general thoughts of the Google Pixel Fold, which has been rumored for so long, and people are exci- generally excited because it seems like a capable little device. This is the one. This is the one that gets me to switch to Android. This right here. <gasps> you heard yeah. it here, folks. No. Um, you know, I, I do like I do like the form factor quite a bit. Um, uh-huh. it's, I, I like the wider front. I think that's that's a win because um, the, the Samsung just feels too skinny. You know, it's, I'm, I'm like, if I'm looking for a smaller phone, I'd want you know the iPhone five style. Um, as far as the hinge goes, I'm mm, man. They should get me to test these things because I would break that thing in no time. Like my my fidgetability is way up we, we need it we need a, a name for that factor like just the, the something factor is your fidget factor of just like how the often factor, you can't yeah. you gotta, gotta click things so 1799 though is it's i mean it's right on par for all the other why did you buy this folding phone phones um I, i'm seeing i'm seeing people with them I, specifically like the, like the flip phone style and you know it's like all it does is make me want to find my game boy advance sp but <laughs> Like that, I'm just I'm not seeing the benefit, right? Mm-hmm. When you when you shove it in your pocket, it's thicker. <laughs> You've got to do that oh, to get to get the screen size out. I feel like old man yells at cloud, right? Like no, it is the yeah. children who are wrong. But 
I just, it, this introduces all of the things that I don't want. A screen with a, a crease and lower, just naturally lower fidelity. Uh, you know, the moving parts of a hinge built in. <sighs> Should Apple do this? You know what? Honestly, if, if at WWDC, Tim was like, good morning, folding phones. I'd be like, okay, why? <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> I'd be like, why? Like, 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 show me you know why I need on, this. Let's be honest. <laughs> was that? No, no, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be in. Right, because I, I, I the Apple one. Because I, because I got to know, and I just, I, I'm, not, I'm not seeing it right now. If if they have the compelling reason, great. I just, I know that's the thing. I'm a fairly imaginative person. I'm not seeing it. So, for those who love folding phones, bless you. Someone has to. Not me. Though. One of the one of the use cases they they showed was that you have like the the screen on one side, and you got like a video that's playing like a, what do you call that wrong ratio or whatever yeah, got, and got. then you open it up and it expands guess what rotate your phone <laughs> <laughs> it's like that's not a great use case like i mean that's cool it's cool but it's a gimmick right that's a gimmick you can still do that maybe not as large but you can still get like i don't know it's the, it's actually it's that like, one right there the, the spreadsheet yeah. That right there is a terrible experience on my phone. Way better on my tablet, and I got to carry two devices. But this right here, if I was if I was like just a spreadsheet assassin, boom, that's my phone. That's about it. <laughs> it's interesting. The design language on it is is, is definite uh, iPhone six vibes. It's like they smushed two iPhone sixes yeah. together with a hinge, and it's it's um, it's not ugly. Uh, again, the, the, the crease. The iPhone six did bend. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I I, I yeah. had four of them. Uh, with the six plus, that is. Oh, don't even stop putting in your back pocket. Yeah, skinny jeans. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, like you're a monster. But the crease, he definitely the crease is still a thing. Apparently, it's less visible than on the Samsung offerings. You know, we are four generations deep into Samsung's offerings here, so it seems like this is a trend that's not going away anytime soon. You know, Google now is just getting into it. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the modes it has here, I can't remember what they call it, but where you kind of you flip it up and it's, it's uh, you, where you could have stuff on the bottom and on the top, kind of in an L shape. Yeah, it reminds me of my, yeah. my Nokia communicator where I use the you'd have the, the QWERTY keyboard and then the screen sitting upright. The Apple Emate. This is good for video conferencing, perhaps. Say again. Yeah. The Apple Emate. Yes. Oh, yes. Right. <laughs> Except like a fraction of the size, and 100% less translucent plastic from the 90s, which so, is disappointing. <laughs> so those are a few highlights from Google's I.O. We focus mostly on the hardware, a little bit on their AI announcements. And if you're interested in learning more about what was announced, there are um, a couple of articles that we will link in the show notes uh, from Wired, if you can get past their paywall, <laughs> if you have enough free articles left, or even uh, The Verge. There are even more tools uh, that they talk about their AI tools and um, Software features that are being built into the various platforms. I think one of the one of the clever uh, um, callbacks, what, and that kind of describes what's happening now with these language models, especially as they get integrated into search, is it's called the Ask Jeevesification of online search. Because in the late '90s, we saw you know to a rival to I think I'm not sure if it was before or after Google, but we had so many different first generation. Uh, search engines out there, whether it was you know, Yahoo or Dogpile or Mama or Excite. Alta Vista. Alta, and then Alta Vista was kind of like the new gold standard. And that reigned yeah. for a couple of years. And then Google came along and totally upended things with the, how it ranked things using page rank and you know, relevance based on how, backlinks and the like. But one of the tools that I, I used for a while I was rather fond of was Ask Jeeves because you could type in natural language questions and it would do a reasonable job of parsing your question and giving you relevant results. But Google's results ended up just being so much better and at the, for a, you know, a while more relevant and le less filled with spam. Uh, they had some spam troubles in the early 2000s, but I have to say I'm a little uh, nostalgic for Ask Jeeves. So maybe we will see the, the, the resurrection of Ask Jeeves with a full on AI brain. Um, Speaking of, in particular, there's another quick little thing I wanted to uh, talk about here. It was this one artificial intelligence-ish movie that we saw in the back in the 80s was War Games. That was one that captured the imagination of a generation talking about the, you know, 
the danger, possible dangers of AI and you know, nuclear weapons and the like. Let's get all those things in there. But there's a, a neat article today on The Verge. Uh, it's called Plugged In and Logged On, A History of the Internet on Film and uh, Television. And it mentions movies like Hackers and the X-Files, particularly the lone gunman in their use of uh, the internet uh, depicted on screen. And, uh, you know, War Games was mentioned, uh, a dystopian horror called Mind Warp that I'm not familiar with, movies like Videodrome. Videodrome. Uh, you can even get into things like La Lawnmower Man or The Matrix if you really wanted to keep uh, pushing things, uh, sneakers um, and others. So I just I will link this article in the in the show notes for those who are interested. But I wanted to ask you, fellas, is what are some mm -hmm. of your favorite depictions of tech? It could be the internet or tech hardware. It could be programming um, uh, in TV <laughs> or films because Sometimes, whether it's laughable or actually pretty credible, uh, one example, one laughable example I'll give you is <laughs> Swordfish, which in which yeah, we're yeah. supposed to, we're expected to, um, <laughs> we're expected to believe that Hugh Jackman is a computer nerd. It's like, <laughs> it's like uh, so it, there's a human side of it too in these depictions, not just the tech side. And not to mention so much like hacking is is displayed as like navigating these three D universes to you know to inject malware and whatnot and some of the stuff is like I know I this. Get it. It's a Unix system, <laughs> exactly. So, um, Gray, what what, what are, any things come to mind in depictions of uh, internet access or tech in general in TV or film that you're fond of for there were positive or negative yeah. reasons? <laughs> The two. And the first one was was Huge Jackman in Swordfish. Like he literally read yeah. my mind on that one. The piano playing and the multiple screens and the, you know, just uh -huh. just amazing. Um, and that's that's kind of that's almost a follow on from Keanu Reeves in um, Johnny Mnemonic. Right. Like they're they're they're, they're spiritually brothers. Uh, but the one that I wanted to talk about here uh, is in Star Trek Lower Decks, okay. and that is Jeffrey Coombs as Ajimus, the uh, homicidal, self aware megalomaniac computer. Um, Star Trek. Here's the crazy thing, actually has a ban on AI in world because Control, one of the first AIs, went crazy and tried to kill everybody in the galaxy. And there's a whole thing in Star Trek Picard about how AI is set to kill us and the Romulans have a secret society dedicated to making sure that AI never rises. And Jeffrey Coombs, who has played like nine or 10 different characters across multiple series, shows up as the voice of this computer and it is a freaking delight. So uh, it's just... He's a megalomaniac computer who doesn't quite have power. So he's always trying to like, maybe you could plug me into your, your communicator. It's just, it's wonderful. You know you so, want to. Very, <laughs> right? Good, good choice. <laughs> uh, Will, any uh, any depictions of internet or, or tech come to yeah. mind? Uh, so as you mentioned, I, you know, I've i taught classes and I used to bring up a lot of examples, particularly because there was one where I would give the history of, of the web and coding. And so I would give some of these examples. Um, I used to read out the movie poster for The Net, which uh, is very hard dated now. Um, so uh, yeah, nice. and that's sort of when the internet was uh, very much um, like in the zeitgeist and it was the scary thing, the scary new thing that scared people. So um it, it ages really hard if you've seen it recently. Um, and so, I mean, they're using CRTs. It's practically DOS. Hey, CRTs like, are making a comeback, man. We were just talking about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the other two are TV shows. I'll bring them up quickly. One is the original Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., where I forget the character, but uh, it, she became Quake, I think. Yeah. Um, and she was a social media expert, but yet she hacked the internet. And it was like, I don't think they quite know what a social media expert is and what, what like a programmer is. Like, it's just kind of mashing those two together. And the final one I'll bring up, which was one of the most disappointing shows of all time. And I hated it with a flaming passion. And I only watched the first episode and I refused to watch it after was the show named Scorpion. And you might not remember it, but it was a bunch of nerdy tech people. And they were like a special agency of like super intelligent people that could figure out any problem. And of course, 
there was a there was a very good looking female and a very good looking guy that there was sexual tension the whole time and you knew that they were going to get together by the end of the first season or the second season or something anyways the first episode a plane goes rogue or something and they need to update it so they get a they get an ethernet cable and they hook it up to a flying plane to to take control of it so they have like a huge ethernet cable that's attached to the plane like the refueling and get. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah so it's just like so ridiculous anyways there it's i go tough. genius uh, one one little bit of non-internet tech that uh, I enjoyed was in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. I think I saw that when I was fifteen, and he had he had a, a pretty expensive like sampler in his bedroom, and yeah. he was using it to like fake being sick and call into his you know call into school and you know pretend he was coughing and all that kind of stuff. I thought that was kind of cute, and maybe like oh, I got to get a sampler. Um, but one yeah. of more a more recent example was in uh, John Wick chapter two. And it's a bit, it's not really realistic, but for some reason they had Commodore VIC 20s uh, uh, being used as, uh, as keyboards connected up to these green screen terminals that were not displaying Commodore VIC 20 text uh, by, by any stretch of the imagination. It actually looked more like Apple II, but it was these, these kind of uh, uh, almost, uh, what do you call them? Suicide girls type, uh, type uh, administrators who were entering these, uh, you know, things they were like the, the dispatchers for the assassins and whatnot. And um, it, it was just, it was kind of cool. It was an, definitely aesthetic, a quasi steampunk sort of aesthetic, but with tattoos and Commodore Vic 20s and green screen monitors. It, it's, it's weird because it almost feels like the system should be air gapped, but it's clearly communicating across the network using pneumatic tubes as well. Exactly. The lore in that yeah. universe is amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, let's uh, wrap up and get to our picks of the week. And starting with Mr. Silver. Will, what is your pick of the week? My pick of the week is Star Wars The Bad Batch. Uh, this is following a common theme, which that I uh, finished up The Clone Wars. It only took me uh, three years to do uh, with my uh, wife. Um, I had actually watched uh, the first five seasons, but I started from scratch. And um, then we watched Tales of the Jedi, which was my pick last week. And then my pick this week is The Bad Batch, which I am actually really, really enjoying. Um, and so I, I highly recommend it. Now, I know the show, the shows, the cartoon shows aren't for everyone. Um, I will say that the hallmark of these um star wars animated series so the clone wars rebels um this one included is a annoying kid uh um <laughs> protagonist and this is the least annoying kid protagonist of all of those three series that i've i've mentioned uh, so i highly recommend it uh, ahsoka redeems herself by the end by the way but yeah. she is obnoxious in the first couple of seasons of the clone wars um Ezra there is no redemption for him he's obnoxious all the way through rebels um you know so I I see some people doubting me that's cool that's cool um but yeah I I really dislike Ezra uh with a flaming passion I like all the other characters love me some chopper um but uh but yeah so um I highly recommend Bad Batch they're they're not really too much I dislike about it. Um, I, I really enjoy also seeing this is set after, um, you know, um, what would be Return of the Jedi, so episode six. Um, and we sort of see the consequences of the rise of the Empire and, um, you know, what happens to those clones that were the, um, the army um, in uh, the first... Uh, prequels the first three movies and and what happens to them afterwards and i'm finding it very interesting and now it's a deep dive it's a deep cut it's for nerds uh but you know guilty as charged and i was going to ask when this takes place for those who are only from, mostly familiar with the live action movies or yeah. tv shows so you're saying it's after return of the jedi is it um is it or sorry no it's a, it's a, after it, sorry no revenge it's after uh revenge of the oh okay yeah. so it's before yeah. Yeah. Before yes. the uh, original trilogy. Okay. Yeah. Empire's gotcha. at its heights. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. Um, I mean, Gray, what is your momentous pick this week? 
Oh, sorry. And I was going to say people, was... you can watch that on Disney Plus. Just so anyone's looking for the bad vibes, that is on Disney Plus, correct? Yeah. All right. Great. Take it away. You're Ezra redeemed. Mistake. Ezra redeemed himself by getting flung across the galaxy. That's that was like, that was. It's true. It's true. He had uh, five no, no. minutes of redemption. <laughs> He's, well, no, wow. so here's the thing. Mandalorian, we're hearing about Grand Admiral Thrawn coming back this time. Yeah, well, yeah, we've uh, seen some teasers of Ezra, so maybe he'll be better. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so this, this is the Ikea status, and I've got a bunch of them all over the place. They're $19.99 for the skinny ones. This is $29.99. Behind me, I've got a wall control unit, which is amazing. Like, this is load-bearing and can handle heavy stuff. This is for everything else, for organization. I absolutely love these things because you can mount them to a wall. They can all connect there. You can also bolt them to the side of a desk. I, this is changing my life from an organizational perspective. I can find all of my tools. I can find all of the stuff. It's, so there's a, there's a lab rebuild going on. A bunch of cool, some coolness stuff coming. But this right here, I'm actually, I've got more of them throughout the house. So it's it's pretty cool. Um, at thirty bucks, they're quite functional; don't stand on their own. But you can also get lots of cool little pieces for them as well that clip in. Um, which you can see some of them here. They've got like the little J hooks and things. Uh, there's a little magnetic okh okay. strip. There are. Um, Is it a build a bear? Yeah, yeah boxes and bins <laughs> that kind of you know that clip in, which is really great. Um, but the baskets. There are shelves. There are document retainers, all sorts of really cool, neat things. They even have, so the, the black stuff is actually their gamer branded one with ridiculous non-text on it. But this, two of these hold a keyboard really nicely onto this the shelf. And I've got three or four different keyboards that I cycle through. So super handy. Um, it's my pick of the week. Great. Nice. Good stuff. Very quickly, because I've got to rush away to uh, dinner reservations. Mm. My pick of the week is kind of on theme. I actually changed it at the last minute when we were, we were talking about uh, internet and, and tech as depicted in TV and film. And I don't think I've really talked about this show before because it ended before we started Momentous Live. Um, and that is the series on AMC called mm. Halt and Catch Fire. Mm. Anyone that is at all interested in the history of computers and the internet, um, I definitely check it out. Stars uh, Lee Pace and others, and it is great. The first season is uh, starts with a, a, a PC clone manufacturer based in Texas, I believe. It's loosely based on the story of Compaq. And then each season, these various characters go off to get, to start other enterprises over the course of about, I think, 15, you know, 10, 15 years or so. Uh, there's one season where they have a BBS's bulletin board system. And by the end, it's the dawn of the web. Nice. Very cool. Lots, lots of nerd content there. Uh, great acting. A little metal, melodramatic at, at times. But uh, I definitely uh, recommend it if you can find that on any streaming services, uh, AMC and... Um, uh, AMC Plus, perhaps, and you know, it, it probably comes and goes on uh, other uh, streaming services like Netflix and, and whatnot. But uh, I I'll find a link um, for where it's currently playing and include that in the show notes as well. So that's Halt and Catch Fire. And uh, lastly, just one of us with a project this week, and as mentioned, uh, our colleague Tasia has a video where she recaps Google I.O. 2023 in a mere 12 minutes and 13 seconds. So you can find that video at youtube.com slash Tasia Custody and all of her work at tasiacustody.com. And I just realized that my laptop has 8% battery left. Nice. I even ah! plugged in. I'm just under the wire. <laughs> I'm plugged in, but it's not, I'm not getting enough juice from this little brick. So it's been slowly declining as time Pulling goes Pulling a huge on. app in there. So, oh. yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And of course, you can find out more about us at momentous.tv slash links, momentous.tv slash team, and the audio version of this very show at momentous.tv slash podcast and all your favorite podcast platforms. Okay. Wonderful work, gentlemen. Glad to have you. Tasia, we miss you. Hope to see you next week. And until then, we hope your week is truly momentous. <laughs>